this episode of Thriving in Construction, the podcast, you will hear great ideas about handling matters involving public and private construction projects and real estate development, along with government contracting compliance. Our guest for today is attorney Lisa Heron Colon, the construction attorney and partner of Soul Erring and Arstein and Lear LLP. As a tough lawyer, she has handled bench trials through the verdict in state and federal courts as well as arbitrations ending in awards for clients. For decades, Lisa has counseled countless players in the construction industry. Tune in to see how and why attorney Lisa Heron Colon was certified as a mediator by the Florida Supreme Court and as an arbitrator by the American Arbitration Association. Let us welcome attorney Lisa Heron Colon. Thank you so much for being here and accompanying me in this uh, journey with uh, Thriving in Construction, the podcast. Patricia, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We haven't seen each other for so long, but it's great. It's great to be here. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be out and about, and um, I'm looking forward to this discussion. So I, I'm a, an admirer of yours. <laughs> I, I'll have my autograph because <laughs> you've been in this industry for two decades, right? Uh, yes, actually, this year will be 22 years of being a construction lawyer. So tell us about you. So, like I said, I've been a construction lawyer for 22 years. I represent folks that all the players in the construction industry, from the contractors to the architects, the engineers, developers, public entities. And I've been doing it for, for, for like I said, two decades now. So construction, anyway, I always ask me, what's construction law, right? So... It's just one part of a really large industry. Construction is a, it's a mammoth of an industry. We will always have construction. I mean, as long as humans are on earth, we're going to build. We're going to build, we'll, we'll build it differently at certain times, but we're always going to have building, we're always going to need infrastructure, we're always going to need a place to live. Um, brick and mortar is never going to go away, right? So a, a part of that is dealing with all of the legal issues that arise during construction. And so... What I do is I counsel and guide uh, either owners or contractors in any type of legal, well, prepare them not to have legal disputes on the front end, but also guide them through the project and try to resolve disputes as they come up. And if we can't just resolve the dispute, then I am also the litigator, you know, the Perry Mason in the courtroom. <laughs> How's that mm-hmm. role? I can't imagine you such an angel. Ah, yeah, a wolf in sheep's clothing, I think. <laughs> no, and actually, I, I cut my teeth in litigation. So when I first got out of law school, that's what I did. I mean, I, I tried my first case as a, a the second week of my first firm. So I, um, and it was a jury trial. So I grew up as a litigator, and it's part of what my DNA is. And Although now I don't do it as much, you know, I, 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 I'll get into the courtroom every now and again. I don't do it as much. It's still part of what keeps me, uh, what, what, the, mo- the, most, the, the most fun part of what I do. Really? Yes. What's fun about it? Because it, it ain't fun for me, but what, what do you find fun about litigation? I like the banter. I like, first of all, it's a storytelling, right? So the person with the, the, the person with the attorney that can tell the best story and you know, people think that, you know, I'm going to go to court and I'm going to tell my story. Right? Well, unfortunately, our legal system is not set up for you to just tell your story. We have rules of evidence and we have to play by those rules. So not everything that's said or done often gets heard by the, to the, by the judge or definitely not to the jury because um, the rules of evidence are strictly applied when it comes to a jury trial. So it's the ability to take a set of facts and to tell your story through a set of facts in a confined set of but I like that. It's, it's like putting a puzzle together. And then part of it's acting, <laughs> you know? Part of it's the drama. Maybe I was supposed to be an actor, <laughs> actress in a former life or next life. But I like the acting. You know, it's, it's part of just being dramatic and telling a story. And that's the fun part of it. Um, but it's, you're right. It's not fun for the client. It's uh, an expensive proposition. People, you know, I often, you know, clients often come to me and say, well, I want to go to court and I want to take it to, you know, I just want to take it to the judge. I want to have my day in court. And I was like, well, your day in court has been cost you a lot of money. And to have principle and to want to just stick it to someone, that costs a lot of money. And it's a lot of work. 
and it's a lot of headache. It's a lot of time away from your business. So let's figure out a way to resolve. Resolution is the better way. Uh, I, I, I always say to my, I always say to my clients, I want to help you solve your problem. I want to be a part of your business, helping you solve your problem. I am not. The, if you want just a person to go into court and fight your battle, then I'm probably not the lawyer for you. I can do that, and I will certainly do it if, if we need to. But I see my role as being a part of your problem solving machine. Because what we need to do is just keep the project going, keep it moving, and get get it built. Because all. Only thing anyone wants in this industry is to see the final project. And you're right. A lot of times the ego gets in the way mm -hmm. and what's fair, right? Uh, other than really life is not fair. Most of the times, you know, many times it's not. We don't want to let the ego be the one making decisions for us. No, definitely not when it comes to a legal decision because it's never, first of all, it's never going to be a fair resolution. Anytime you, nobody ever walks away. I've been doing this for 22 years. Nobody ever walks away from a resolution, a mediation, or any type of dispute, or, um, dispute resolution procedure feeling happy. No, I, nobody ever even walks away from court feeling happy because although you may have a win in court, when you look at the business proposition to get that win, it's probably not a win on paper. In terms of your fight in, in your balance, in the, your, your balance sheet is probably not a win. And then at the end of the day, what you get when you go to court is a piece of paper to, telling you that you won. You know, the judge is not going to make the defendant or the, whoever owes you the money there in court sit, take out their checkbook and write the check to you there. That's the that's a whole other process. So really, what, what I, when I try to counsel my clients, I try to figure out what a win is for them, and then. Sometimes you have to, as a lawyer, we say I'm almost like a therapist sometimes. Like you have to say, well, what do you want out of this? What's going to make you, what's the feel-good solution for you and how do we get there? Because you're probably not going to get everything you want out of this, right? It's a whole bunch of balancing uh, acts. But yes, the ego, the ego cannot, cannot let your ego drive businesses. You will always, a win, even if you win, a win never looks really like, like a win. Absolutely. And what we fail to quantify it's the impact that this situation has in your business in your energy in your focus and it's really kind of keeps you at home in a way it doesn't really i mean the time the time time is limited right it's not that you can multiply it and if you have to spend two hours of your day thinking about this strategizing about it and it's in the back of your head all the time it's taking away time from you and focus on creation, on new projects, on new ventures. So I don't know if you can, you can quantify that uh, objectively, but it definitely has an impact. Well, you know, especially for smaller businesses, right? I mean, you have large multinational companies that have departments full of lawyers and staff dedicated to solving all their legal problems. But usually the average construction company doesn't have that type of resource, right? And so what, when, when you do get into a situation, when you do get into a problem, you're right. You are taking away not only the executive's time to deal with and make the decisions because it's the executive that's going to make the decisions, but you're also taking away all of the people who are involved in whatever the issue is, or creating the issue or solving the issue or making the decisions around the issue. You're also taking their time and their energy away from doing what they're supposed to do, which is building the project and thinking about other projects to build, right? So it's very important when you talk about quantifying it, you know, it's really hard to quantify it because if you stop to think about the amount of time it takes when something does arise in the field from the time that happens to solving it and moving on, you take a look at how many hours are spent, you probably never really recapture that in terms of monetary gain or loss, right? You probably never, businesses don't normally track that kind of time to that, especially small businesses. Let's, let's, you know, small businesses don't track and quantify that time. Like how much did we lose? How much money did we really lose in terms of inefficiency in dealing with this problem? So it's important for small businesses to, I, I call it like a catch and release. You need to identify it, solve it, and move on. You know, and that's why we talk about ego. You can't let it fester. You can't let a problem fester because problems never go away. They just grow, right? Like a, like a cancer. You find, you know, you find this little boil, but by the time you know it, it's infected your whole body. 
right? So sometimes businesses don't know how to how to catch and release and ca- how catch and go. It depends on the size of the business. I mean, some t- making the decision whether you're you, you go after litigation or you don't. Sometimes it's it's a it's a it's a hard decision to make. It's, it could be a tough decision. Why do I say that? Some companies and and you and I have been involved in in a case. There's large companies, sometimes developers, that their protocol is precisely not do the right thing, not to pay, put the smaller company in a in a very difficult situation because they know they 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 have limited amount of resources of people of of financial resources and they just want to put yourself in a situation like that so that you can you know you they either get you because you're not performing they don't pay you you're not i'm, I'm gonna get you out you know take the balance in the contract or if you finish the job i'm still not gonna pay you you're gonna have to go after me and in two years or three years, if you can still with, are alive, I if I judge the worst thing that can happen to me is I just says, okay, you have to pay them, and I have to pay you anyways. So what I might as well. I mean, that's a I, that's a practice. So you just identify something that's so important for small businesses, and when I talk to small businesses about you know just surviving and thriving in this industry, not every job is a good job. You know, just because you've been offered the job doesn't necessarily mean you want to take the job, right? And what do I mean by that? Definitely large companies, developers, sometimes even large construction companies, national, multinational companies, they have reputations, right? They all do. And they work in different uh, cities and different locales. And, you know, they they build reputations over the years. Know who you're working for. Example, I have a lot of clients that love enjoy or feel safe doing public work to a certain extent yes you may know this very well you'll get paid and you may get paid slowly but eventually at the end of the day the public entity has to pay right if you've done the work and it's been approved federal government great client to have if you can have it because they will pay you they have their bureaucracy but can you as a small business do you have the resources to navigate the bureaucracy of the federal government and what do i mean by that there's a lot of compliance as you know there's a lot of paperwork it's not just getting into the project, doing the work, building the project. Then you have to come home and like a doctor, you have to chart everything that you did that day. You have to file certain paperwork. You need to tell the federal government who was on their project. There's so much compliance that goes into government contracting work. Often I tell my small clients, if you're not set up in a back house for that, if you don't have a good back of house system to deal with those issues, then that's really not you're not ready. And that's saying it's not for you, but you're not ready until you understand what it takes to successfully complete a federal project contract. Absolutely. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. Lisa, um, your experience is vast. I know you, you started as a litigator. We were taught, we, you gave us some light uh, as to what happens. And now you're doing arbitration. So I'm, I'm so curious as <laughs> to how you went from how you started and then now a litigator. And, and also tell us about the challenges or the, the biggest challenges that you've had in the courtroom. Or it, maybe it's even engaging a client so in, in these two decades. What, ha- what can be highlighted? So, so, so just to back up, yes, I'm an arbitrator too. I, I arbitrate with the American Arbitration Association where I sit on their panels as an arbitrator, which really means I make the, to help make the decisions. Um, I sit as a judge, pri- as a, a private judge. Um, but to answer your question with regard to the, my biggest challenge is, you know, throughout my career, I think I've always had to fight to have a spot and to have a say, have my voice heard. Right. To convince, though, I mean, we, we, we work in a very male, white male dominated. So our clients are white. Most of our clients are, are white men. And, you know, there's what the saying is that people do business with people who they know, like and trust. You know, the trust part, probably I could get over easier, but they don't know. And, you know, I don't know if they like. Right. Or, you know, can, can you do a good job? I, I mean, I've heard things in my career like, well, are you aggressive enough? Or, you know, or really, can you do that? I've even had um, a client tell me one time, well, are you going to be here? If I hire you today, are you going to be here in nine months? And I'm like, no, right. so I said, what? So I didn't understand the question. I didn't understand the comment because I wasn't even thinking, right? 
And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you're going to be around in nine months or you're going to be off on maternity. And I'm like, so, well, last time I checked, I wasn't pregnant. <laughs> hey, am I fine? <laughs> Do, you know something? fine? <laughs> Do you know something I don't know? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've had clients make those incredulous comments to me. So that's, you know, one of the things I've struggled with is just... I mean, be incredible. Like, yes, I can do proving, proving myself. Yes, constantly. constantly proving myself. And then when you develop, so, you know, as a young attorney or as a young professional, it's the constant proving yourself. I can do just as good a job as my male counterparts. I can probably do a better job because I come with a whole different perspective than they do, right? A whole different background. And that's what diversity is all. That's why we champion diversity because you want people of different backgrounds and perspectives to solve your problem. But then when you get to where I've gotten, then you have the imposter syndrome set in, right? Like you, you have people tell me, like you, you know, oh, I'm in awe. I, I feel uncomfortable. I do, I do not accept praise really well. I lie. I mean, it, I, I'm gracious for it. And I always tell people, you're too kind. But then you wonder, am I really, can I live up to what people see of me? Do but, I have to continue to grow? Right. And, and, and am I going to, who am I going to disappoint? Like, am I, re- is this really me? Am I really living, am I a fake? So some days I really think I'm a fake. Like, I feel like I'm not, like, because you wake, I wake up and there's the struggle and, you know, you're making this, you know, we're human, we make well, mistakes. You, have, you know, it, it comes with identity. You got to a place where you, 20 years ago, I'm not sure if you saw it possible because of all the struggles you had to, of circumvents in life from child. So you get to a point where you're here, all of a sudden now I'm an arbitrator and I'm this and I'm that and the other. I work for a really large company. I solve big problems and it comes with changing the identity. So now you want to put yourself in another level that you thought, you know, you might not have thought of. Right. And, and where I am, if somebody would have ever told me, even 10 years ago, that I would be a partner at a Amlaw 200, 400, you know, 200 law firm with 400 attorneys nationwide, I would be like, are you kidding me? That's absolutely not. No one's going to be a partner there. You know, I'm not going to have the business to kind of even compete. Who's going to have, you know, and now I have, you know, I have multinational clients, you know? So, it, but it's just that every day waking up and believing that's possible. And for me, and we talk about the spiritual journey. For me, that's huge. You know, waking up every day and believing, setting the mindset and believing that, yes, I can do this. There's nothing stopping me. There's absolutely nothing stopping me but myself, my own thoughts, my own thoughts. 80% of our success or failure, it's result of our mindset, our psychology. And it's it's a work every day. It's not something you can ever take for granted or never work on. It's It's a daily, daily work. It's putting ourselves in a position every day where we're working in a state empowering state where we can you know we know that we can solve a problem that we're coming from gratitude too because a lot of times you know it really everything that we want is related to gratitude at the end of the day how able are we to change the circumstance that we don't like for an appreciation how can we appreciate what's happening right now well, I, you know, I think that gets with age because I don't know if I would have had the same thought at 30 that I do now in my 40s because you really don't. Now I wake up with an appreciation for life because so much has happened, right? And I realize that this journey is going to end one day and I have a little bit of control of how it ends in terms of how, how they tell my story, right? But it's not, it's not I mean, we live through a pan- we're, we're living through a pandemic. We survived a pandemic when so many People that we know and love did not. So I never take that for granted. Um, and so, I'm, yes, yes, I'm grateful. Like, I pinch myself sometimes in the, in the morning. I'm like, is this really? Happening? This is happening to me? Like, really, truly, I have this amazing career to get up to every day. And I talk about a lot about you have to love what you do. If you're not loving what you do, you're wasting your life, right? Your work should bring you immense pleasure. It really should. And no matter what that work is, there's no work too small not to be make you happy. And I am just so lucky to have had the opportunity and the blessing to, I've always wanted to be a lawyer and I've had the blessing to be a lawyer. And then I, at one point I had the decision of whether I want to be a construction lawyer and to, to continue down this path, even though I don't have a technical background, I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer. But every day in my career, in my life, in my, my daily work, I learn something new. There's no two days are the same. 
None. You know, I learn something new every day. And how many people can really say that? You know? I, I think that's crucial, but it is why you are where you are. If you didn't like this career, I don't think you could have overcome all the challenges that you have and continue to be persistent, resilient, persevere through a pandemic and be, I mean, come at, come at the end of the pandemic, actually better, work-related, better off than how you started. Right. And you have, you know, part of that, Trisha, is being fearless too, right? I think a lot of what holds us back is the fear of the unknown, fear of failing, the fear of what people think about us. If I you know, if we, we, we love speaking, sometimes the fear of if I get up in front of an audience and I don't sound as articulate as I think I should sound, um, what are they going to think? But I think that's not going to happen to you. You're an attorney. <laughs> uh, yeah. The, yeah, I'm an attorney, but not all the sentences sometimes, you know, the, the, I grew up as a child of the Caribbean. Sometimes the words come out backwards. <laughs> That might be to me. I used to, I used to think like my accent. This, all of those are stories. All of those are stories. Disempowering stories. Oh, all of those are stories. Uh, absolutely. But I, I think about where you know the rooms that I've had to stand in, and sometimes the unseen and unheard, or at least feel unseen and unheard. It's it's a matter of just just being fearless. Like it really, at some point in my career, I believe that I belong as just as much as John, Chad. Absolutely. I think we're, we're all one. We, we, I believe we come from one source. And I don't think there's discrimination or exclusion. You know, we're all one. And that's the topic of diversity and inclusion. It's very it's fascinating to me how we talk about it. But at the end of the day, it's essence for the human, human, for, for the human, for the human life. We're all one, you know. We all come from one. So when we're in the enterprise, why not think about inclusion, including everyone, ex- instead of excluding? You know, why don't we think about trying to make sure that the melting pot is really, is really that so that we, when we make decisions, we have all the information that we could have or as much as we can. When we're innovating, we have ideas and we're not excluding ourselves from possibilities. Well, for me, diversity, diversity inclusion is a two, takes two parts, like a dance, right? So on one hand, it takes, the, it takes the system, the society that we live in, right? To be open, right? To have a fair playing field, right? So that one party is not starting out as trying to catch up. You know, one party is not starting the race from 2,000 feet behind. Right. Um, so it takes society to be open, but then it also takes the individual to go grab that opportunity. Right. Because we can have all the open society we want, but if you're not the individual who's willing to jump, leap, the not fear of failing, not being afraid, you know, the, the, the person with the ambition. I mean, that's why this country is so great. Right. Because as imperfect as it is, and it's been, in America is not an even playing field by any means or measure. But it gives you the opportunity more than other countries, as you know, you've lived in other, I've lived in another country. There is a, le- there is a space here in this country that if you want it, no matter how hard the barrier, you may have to, you may have to climb 10 foot more to get there, but it's at least it's, the wall is there for you to climb. In some countries, the wall's not even there. Absolutely. I believe this country is a country of opportunities to do Really good, the really good things and the really bad things. Yes. <laughs> you can do anything you choose. Right. You have the, you have the choice. And I, I totally agree with you. Tell me about the challenges. I know you, it's been a, you've been breaking barriers, but I, I want to hear about a legal challenge. A, I mean, we have one in common. We've, we've mm-hmm. seen different people act different ways, but what's been the most challenging case that you've had that you can identify now in retrospect mm-hmm. that has transformed you or opened doors of opportunity. It was hard, but you, your life would not be the same had you not gone through that. Hmm, that's a good question. Well, there's one case I always, when people ask me that question, there's one case I always talk about that not necessarily transformed my career, but really transformed my thinking as a lawyer. You know, I always advocate for small businesses. It's kind of my passion. It's my sub-niche in my practice. I, uh, we were talking before that I would always represent small businesses. There, it is. Any firm that wants to have me, any company that wants to have me has to understand that's part of my passion. So I'm always in tune to businesses, uh, small business issues, which are, you know, this country is driven by small businesses. It's, what's, it's how we employ most of the people in this country. 
But in construction, as we talked about a little bit before, you know, being a small business has a lot of challenges. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot there for failure. So anyway, I had this case where I represented a general contractor and it wasn't even my client. It was a client of one of my partners in another state. And, um, but it was a Florida case. So I got put on the case and we had done the contracts for, uh, the GC, just general costs, his general subcontracts to sign with the subcontract. And, um, he had used that subcontract. Um, it was a family company, it's a family owned company and they had used those subcontracts to do a, a build out of a medical uh, office building. Uh, it was a renovation and then to do, uh, an addition to the um, medical office building for a group of cardiologists. This whole deal was sketchy from the beginning. Very sketchy, very sketchy players on the doctor's side, not from the contractor's side. But anyway, our, our clients signed up. They were CM at risk, so they you know, weren't self-performing any of the work. I think probably self-performed some of the demo, but that was really it. Um, so that they used, they relied on the subcontractors, you know, the, to, all, the, all the traits to, to do the work. And in the subcontract that my firm drafted was the infamous pay if pay clause. Pay when pay. Pay when pay, right? Pay if pay, pay when pay, which basically, if you don't know, basically says something like, tells the subcontractors that you're not going to get paid um, and you agree to this and you understand all the risk of it, but you're not going to get paid your payment application until I get paid on your payment application. From the owner, right? And in the south, in most southern states, that's the, the courts enforce that. Um, not all states enforce it, but most southern states, that that's a, a enforceable clause. So we had that in our contract. This project, like I said, it was a big project, about a million, million five uh, to to do the work. But when, of course, that kind of work goes quick. The contract was not the contract was not amended. So you have a form contract, and I was try to warn clients of this, even if I do a form contract for you. So I say, hey, Patricia, here's, you know, here's your form subcontract. You just don't pull it out and just use it on every project. You really got to think through how it works for your subs on each project. But anyway, this, this first project, they didn't really think through the payment, how the payment clauses would work because it was a fast project. It should have been like a, a weekly or a biweekly billing. Instead, it was a monthly billing. So by the time my client had put in the first payment application, the project was almost 50% done. And by the time the last payment application, I think it was only two or three payment applications that came on this project. By the time we put in the, the, last, the final payment application, it was probably only the second or third. We were 90% done and nothing happened. If the first one wasn't paid because it was only 30 days or 45 days since it was submitted and it wasn't paid. And so my client got to 90% substantial completion. Financing the job. Finance, well, he's not, my client's not financing the job. Who's got financing the job? Mm -hmm. The subcontractors. That, but your client was a... The, no, the, the, the GC. The, I represented the GC. So the subcontractor is financing the job. He's not getting paid. They're not getting paid. 90%. So, 90%. So we, we filed, the, everybody filed their liens. We filed our lien. Our subs filed their lien. These doctors went AWOL. Never heard from them. Filed the lawsuit. Got a default. They never answered the lawsuit. This is the first time in my 20... Uh, at this point, I was probably 15 years practicing. This is the first time in my 15-year career that I had filed a lien lawsuit, a foreclosure of a lien lawsuit, and was end up sitting on the courthouse steps about to buy the property. I'd never done that before. Most lien cases, you file it, you fight for a year or two, and it settles. 99.99% of the lien cases settle. Even if they go to trial, at some point they settle. The doctors um, filed bankruptcy? The doctors did not. Well, I don't know what ended up happening because at some point my client, we were at, we were literally at the courthouse steps wondering what to do with this property. And then my client nixed it and said, we can't take this on for tax liability. We we're on the phone with our tax lawyers and we cannot assume this property because of our tax liability. And so my client was just out attorney's fees and whatever money they had spent to get the project and then whatever money they spent on the project, which I said they didn't, they didn't self-perform much work. It is the small companies that got crushed, completely crushed. And that, to me as a lawyer who, who says that I'm for the small guy and I represent the interests of the small guy, to see it play out. And this is, these are things I lecture on all the time. I lecture on at very, various trade associations about pay to paid and things subcontractors need to look for in their contracts and things you must negotiate. And if you do have it, you need to know what it really means for your project. I never thought I would see it play out in this way, the way that I saw it play out in this case. Yeah, some of the, some, most of the, I think there was a bankruptcy, yes. Um, for what a building 
Um, no, the, the, the problem with that is that the, the, this is something I, you're actually touching a nerve with me <laughs> because we've had a situation where we've had this person developing and they are not set up and it goes through sour. We put a lien and the lien doesn't necessarily protect you because if they go bankrupt, oh, yeah. you know, and, and they all, there's somebody else in the first place, it's... Right, so if there's a bank in the first place, this property, yeah, there was actually, in this case, there was, it wasn't even a bank. It was some, that's why I said the venture deal was capital. shady. Right, the deal was shady. There was some venture capital. It, it was all incestuous. They all, you know, brothers and sisters and uncles kind of in the deal. So there was a, a, there was a mortgage in front. So we had to deal with that mortgage and then how much was left in the equity. I mean, it was just a mess. There's really nothing you can do as a lawyer to insulate or protect your client from that situation. That situation is rare, but I always try to tell people it exists. Mm -hmm. It exists. And so if you are going to sit behind a pay pay clause, you're going to sign it because, and again, a lot of companies, a lot of small businesses, they do, they take the work. They want the work. The work is there. They take the work. Well, but you can do pay when paid. And if it's a pay when paid when, uh, with the federal government, you're going to get paid. The pay, federal government, government has provisions to, to mitigate this. You know, the, yes, federal, the, there, they are, there are, if you do work with the federal government, they do have a pay of pay clause. They have a prompt payment clause. Certain other, the states, the state of Florida has a prompt payment clause. Local governments have prompt payment clause. If you're on a private project. Yeah, that's the point. Right. If you're on a private project, there's very little you can do to mitigate it, but you must understand the risk. And I think most people do not really appreciate the risk. Nobody would, nobody on that project ever thought that they would be a subcontractor with a $250,000 contract and that they would never see a dime of their money. That is company ending money for some. Of course. And people don't understand what it is to go, to go into business with a private client. You don't have the scrutiny of the, of the government. You don't have all these compliance stuff, but most likely, you know, it, it might take time you get paid. Private client, I'm not sure who regulates it. If it's even regulated, I don't think it's, it's not regulated not. other than by our laws, oh, right? The contract is your regulation. It's not regulated. It is the where the work is, where the good money is. And we have a reputation, South Jose, we, South Florida, has a reputation, a national reputation, where do not expect that if you sign a million dollar contract that you're going to get paid a million dollars. You probably get paid $980,000. Right. Because the owner is always going to that. That's the game. here, Right. And if you don't know where you would, you, you need to know the, the rules of the game in the place that you're playing, because otherwise you will get you get you get your 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 your, your, your clock clean. Another case that I handled a, a career changing case, I think for me was I, I represented a few subcontractors on the Marlin Stadium. That's another project that broke a lot of subcontractors back. I worked and, and it broke the subcontractors' backs because it was the only gig in town. This was 2009, I think, the project started. Mm -hmm. uh, those contracts were negotiated in 2007, 2008, when, right when the market has crashed. So we didn't have any work here in South Florida. And everybody was on that. Everybody was everybody. on that project. I mean that problem. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Stop recording. <laughs> No, but, but what happened on that project was, you know, I tell folks all the time, again, knowing the rules of the project, when you're on a project such as a stadium, Major League Baseball starts April, whatever, that's April 1st. The ball is going to be thrown April 1st. It's not going to be thrown April 10th because you have a delay. You know, we're not going to use the float to, <laughs> in, the, in the project schedule to push it back. April 1st is when that first pitch is going to be thrown. And so therefore the stadium needs to be open. and all these big contractors that do work have this acceleration clause that most subcontractors don't even understand how that operates. You know, if they say, okay, we're, we're, we're behind, we don't care, we're, we're going to sort, we'll, we'll, we'll sort out who's the, the, the villain of why, who's creating the delay, but at this point, the delay doesn't matter. We need to open on April 1st. So everybody needs to put as many men and women on the project to finish it. We're going to be working 24 hours. Well, if you didn't build that in, even if you're going to get paid at the end, at the end of it, if you didn't build it in to your day-to-day -day payroll, you'll find yourself not being able to meet your payroll until you get paid, what, 60 days? Cash flow. Because probably you don't build it in your schedule of value, so you can't build it because it's a change. Right. 
in the contract, but yet they don't want to hear anything about that. They just want to hear about the completion. Right. And now you're not, you have no ability, no me, no ways, no means to build for it. So now you're at, at your, your cash flow is an issue. Cash flow becomes an issue. And then you're going to be caught up in a delay claim that you'll probably have nothing to do with, right? But you're just going to, it's just how it goes. You're just going to be caught up in that delay, right? Are so you, you have to, you, as a small company, you have to be able to withstand that. Otherwise, you're going to be out. You have to understand, again, it's so important to know what the rules are and what the risk. You have to know what the risk are, but not only know what the risk are, appreciate what that risk really means to you. I can talk all day about a pay with pay clause. But if you don't understand how that really, really works, meaning, yes, you can hold the $250,000 bag at the end of the day waiting for the lien claim, even if you were going to get paid at some point, that may mean two years for a lawsuit. You're going to be holding that. And I, that's, that's, that's what keeps me up at night. That's what, deal, that's what I deal with in my small clients. All of them have the same issue. It's that $300,000 claim, that $400,000 claim, that $100,000 claim that they now have to hire a lawyer and an exorbitant hourly rate to go defend or to protect their rights, and now you just bleed. So the, what, in your opinion, can we do, um, your small businesses, to avoid putting yourself in a position like that from you, the beginning? You think we circle back to not every work is, not every project for you. is for you. It, it comes down to the ideal client. Yes. You really know who you want to work for. Don't work for everybody. You know, and that's because the work is there. You think you're going to build your company like that? No, you have, it, like everything else, it takes strategy. You need to build, if you have a small business, and I think this, Trisha, you've done this so well, you have to be strategic in how you build your company. You know, not, you're not going to chase every piece of work. Not every piece of work is a good piece of work, right? You want to really know, uh, like we said before, I, I like starting off with local government work. Just understand the local government work. You know, you, you'll get, you have to be willing to wait 60 days, slow pay, but you'll get paid. But once you understand what that risk is, understand how to build. What are the building blocks? How are you going to build? Find a GC that you trust and work with that GC. Align yourself. I think you've done that well too in your career, mm-hmm. right? Um, align yourself with good, trusted general contractors who are known in their in that market to be fair. You know, there's certain I'm not gonna name anyone, but there's certain <laughs> folks that are you can they, Google they, them. <laughs> <laughs> there's certain GCs that are known to be subcontract busters. Yes. I mean they they that's their and sometimes they're proud of it. And sometimes it's, it's also listening to your intuition because we have a, a case in uh in common that mm-hmm. you defended us very well and you did a great job. Thank God. Uh we recovered uh, but I remember I, when I was reading this contract, as I read it, I put provisions as for payment clauses and this and the other. And, but you know what? I had this gut feeling that these people, regardless of the contract, you know, if they want to screw me up, one, they can't. And two, they were going to. Like I had this feeling and I still went for it because that's the thing with, in our industry. You think you need the job. You think you need it, you, you, you're in an early stage of the business, you kind of immature in, in, in a way. And you think there's no more work out there or, you know, you think you need it. And sure enough, I mean, it was impressive. I mean, we at the end won, but I Googled these people after the fact, after I knew what I was into. And it, it was there. Yeah, research. And I, I, it happens in my industry too. Sometimes the pipeline, right? You want to build your pipeline up. What do I have? Well, how am I keeping my folks busy? And then, so you just start taking, you know, you just, the pipeline dries up a little bit or it gets slow, you get nervous. So you take, that's when you got to be careful. You know, the desperation take, it's not, it's not, you have to check yourself. If you do the work, works. one thing I've known, work comes from praying, manifesting, <laughs> begging, it comes, <laughs> however it comes. And eventually, you know, the, the good case, the good, the good, the good project will come. Yeah. It will come. Absolutely. But just you cannot get desperate. Yeah, I le- desperation never leads you to anywhere. Mm-hmm. And you know, uh, I'm big into how do you end suffering, right? In, in construction, and and understanding that there's two ways to live life. I have a, a some people, a GH, there's two ways to live life. You're at any point in your life, you're either in a state of suffering or not suffering, right? So when we make decisions from a place where I'm not enough, you know, I don't have work, I'm desperate, you know, I. Or even hiring an employee. Mm-hmm. It's most likely the wrong decision. Anything that we do like that, whether it's I'm getting married because I'm not, I don't know, I, they're putting a gun in my head. 
You go back to your life whenever it hasn't, you know, when you when you make that decision, it typically takes a long time to get out of it. Yes. And it, it pains more pain than the one you had when you were before you were desperate. Exactly. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. You can desperation is a is a very, very bad place to be to make decisions from. You gotta you got to be strategic and trust. You know, trust whatever you trust, whatever belief system that you trust in, trust that it will come through and it will rest. You know, mm -hmm. absolutely. I am a firm believer of that as well. So arbitration, mediation, you know, what are the stages? Because I know there are in the contract, right? These are the different uh, resources that you have to solve a problem. They escalate. What are the, how do you recommend, how do you recommend a company to organize themselves in a way to be strategic, understanding that risk is part of the industry? To be successful at the end, how do you strategically plan yourself accordingly? And can you explain if you get in a situation where there's a turning call, what are the stages, possible stages of resolution and the pros and cons of each? Sure. So let's start with you know, your, your contract is your Bible, right? That's your guide for your project, right? That's your project guide, your project Bible, your project, whatever. And in that, so, so don't ignore it, right? And even if you feel like you are in a position where you do not have much negotiation to add to the contract, at least understand it. Now, I don't, you know, we were in a time, this is all secular, right? So it depends on the economy. You have more leverage in a good economy like this, where labor, where there's shortages of labor, the shortages of talent, use it. Use the, this is a great time for small businesses to really prove themselves, right? Because when things get tighter and you don't have that much bargaining power, you know, companies are going to be looking for the best people that they know they can trust, right? But anyway, putting that aside. So the best thing you can do is one, understand your contract, negotiate your contract as much as you can, right? What you, how do you want to solve problems as problems are going to come up? It's part of, you know, I always tell young attorneys, you know, everybody loves to, people who really don't know our industry will say, well, how's your win rate? You know, how's your, win? I was like, listen, if you haven't lost, you haven't done this long enough. <laughs> if you haven't lost, you haven't done it long enough, or you haven't done it enough, right? So there are going to be problems. How are you solving these problems? I like to set out a, a, a method in the contract where the parties are communicating, right? So You know, if you have, you, you're doing business with a large entity that at some point, depending on the value of the, the dispute, depending on what the dispute is, that the folks in the C-suite are talking to each other. And you're not letting the project managers who are, they could be very good at what they do, but they're tied emotionally to the issue because they were there. They know John's a liar, that that's not what was said in the field, right? He's lying. So bullshit. Right. They, they cannot, you know, they can't, it's human nature. You can't untangle yourself from a dispute and look at it from a high level if you are the one that was there when the dispute happened. So I like to, to have a method or at least counsel the clients like you, we need to speak to the people who are not involved in the dispute. Yes, we're going to get the facts from the people who are involved. But those shouldn't be the folks that are making them. The, the, so, so, so the communication between, again, everything is going to be different depending on the project. You know, big companies have, you know, they have their executive folks that are not necessarily on the project. You're not necessarily talking to the, the you know, the high boss, the CEO, but they're, you know, VPs that are running the project. We want to know who they are and we want to develop a relationship with them. You want to develop a relationship with them. You want them to know who you are. And once you, once there's an issue, start engaging Right. But if there obviously is a pro a problem, your contract is going to dictate that arbitrary talk about arbitration. If you want to go into our and we could spend two hours talking about the pros and cons of arbitration. And your, your former guest, I know he, he told me I don't like arbitration. And a lot of attorneys say that because they lose their they lose control in the process. It's not litigation where litigation has rules and rules of evidence. And we know what we're doing. And this is how we were taught in law school. Arbitration is much more free-flowing, much more open. And whether, it's, whether it is more expensive or not can be subject to debate and really controlled by your arbitrator, right? So all of those things play in. But I, and perhaps because I'm an arbitrator now and because I come with a little, and I've done a few arbitrations, I did a big arbitration uh, a couple of years ago 
where my clients, none of my clients was a, a Venezuelan a developer doing a huge project still being built. And none of my clients on my client side of the table spoke English. Mm-hmm. And we went all the way to arbitration. We were up again with the architect who is a large architect. If I said the name, you would recognize it in Miami. And we went to arbitration in a claim. Uh, the architect sued us. I had to hire. We had full like UN like headsets, you know, the full real time translating for everybody because none of my clients, I didn't trust even the ones who said they spoke English well. I didn't trust them to tell the story in, in, in their second language, right? right? But I saw, but that experience for me as an advocate in arbitration, if my clients were in the courtroom, we'd be dead. Oh, yeah. We would have been dead. We won the case. We won on the liability and our issues. We didn't get all our damages that we wanted. The arbitrator kind of split the baby a little bit on that. But if that if I had to do that case in a courtroom in front of a jury or a judge, I would have lost. They, Hands down. It was like you said, it's a private judge, so it's accommodating to the so to make sure that the truth is being is being told. And, right. and in construction, the panel or the pool of people who are pulled to be your arbitrator are folks like you and me, attorneys who do construction. So one of the, uh, and depending on your case, you either have one, depending on the value of the case, you either have one arbitrator or you can have a panel. This case, we had a panel that was over a million dollars. One of our arbitrators, we had two attorneys and one engineer, right? And that really brings a different perspective. And the engineer was very sharp. He focused in on the business, day-to-day business issues. And one of the issues was whether this was not a part of the basic service scope of work for the architect, right? And he, the engineer asked the architect, well, it's an owner. Owners change their minds all the time. If it's either your basic service or you, you charge them, why don't you just charge them? He picked up on those little things really quickly, right? Whereas if you were perhaps a, a juror, you're like, yeah, you know, that wasn't in your scope of work, right? Yeah, right? they don't have the background. They don't have the background. So you have... And uh, that I love arbitration. Uh, arbitration is not fit for everything. Probably not fit for very small cases unless you can get. Although the AAA has lots of programs now where you do flat fees and so forth, so you you know what your fee, your cost because there's a cost to doing it. You're paying the arbit, you're paying the judge too. So you're paying your lawyers, you're paying the judge, and you're paying the, arbit, the AAA to manage the case. But it's so streamlined that when you think about spending two years in court and all the discovery and depositions and so forth. When, as an arbitrator, I limit my parties. If the case is not a million-dollar case, there's no need to have 10 depositions per side. You know, we're not taking all those depositions. You know, we're going to take who are your main people? Um, who, you know, who do we want to really depose? And it's streamlined, and your decision-maker understands the industry. They have knowledge. So you don't have to spend time educating. In mediation versus arbitration? So mediation is just, a, it's not a, the mediator sits as a guide to help you resolve. The arbitrator makes a decision. So as an arbitrator, I write an opinion and I choose a right or a wrong. I choose a win or a lose. Mediator is just there to help us facilitate the discussion so that the parties can come to an agreement. Right? So a good mediator is just going to open your eyes, should scare you. Just a good mediator, if you're leaving, if you know, people don't, uh, a lot of my clients says, I don't know if I like that mediator. It's like, good. You know why? Because he or she's doing his job because he or she is making you think of this being the devil's advocate. And that's what a good mediator does. It sits in that room with you and say, okay, have you thought about this? What, is, what about this? You know, a jury can do that. They're not supposed to give you advice about your case or tell you if you're going to win or lose, or give you legal advice, but a good media should be able to open your eyes as to what the real... What's possible, what's yeah. possible, that you yes. might not yes. be thinking of. Or you may not... Yeah, you, you, because even lawyers are guilty of this. Sometimes we're so wedded to the story that the client brings us, and then we do the deposition. We're just so wedded to that one particular set of facts and how we think it fits in and then somebody will come and hear the same set of facts and be like oh wait well what about this and you you know the, your, the eyes light up and it's like what i didn't think of that i didn't see it that i didn't even see it that way so that's that's mediation and in, in every case before you head off to if you have a good lawyer before you head off to litigation sometimes even before you file the complaint but not every every case is different you should you should spend the money and the time and go to a mediation how can we get, going back to diversity and inclusion, how can we 
become more diverse? You know, how can our, our society, I know you talked about the society and the individual. What things can we put in place, can we promote from the business perspective, you know, to be more inclusive and more diverse and, and, and see that as a great thing, you know? What can we, you and I do, what can enterprise do, what can government do? This is like a, a big <laughs> open-ended question. A big open-ended question, you know? And where's the solution, to, you know, from where we are today to where we want to be? Actually, let me start with this question instead. Where do you, would, would where would you want to see the aspect of diversity or the world in terms of diversity and inclusion and what can we do to get there? Whether we like it or not, whether we're going to play the diversity inclusion game now or not, it's going to happen, right? The world, this country is browning, right? At right now, the folks that of color just don't have the, uh, the power, power structure in terms of the economic and the political power yet. Right, but it's going to change. Our your grandchildren, your great grandchildren are gonna live in a very different America than we're living in today. So it's going to happen. What we need to do as a society, I think, is in terms of diver- diversity and inclusion, is not be careful that we're not creating a society of the majority that doesn't have a small minority, which is what we're doing right now, right? We have a small minority that's earning all the wealth. And creating all the wealth. I mean, what are the statistics I read or listen to every day is that the billionaires just got richer and richer in the pandemic, right? We need to, and that's why I think part of diversity and inclusion is so important. We don't want to create a society where the majority, we go back to like a feudalism kind of s- structure, where the majority of people are the poor people um, that look like you and me, right? So, what I think what we need to, what we need to do right now, I think what we can do right now is educate. I'm just going to keep it to the construction industry. Let little girls um, or or little you know people of color understand that when we talk about construction, it's not the unsexy part we're talking about. Right? We're not talking about the folks slinging the the mortar and and the bricks because that's not to them. It's, I always tell folks right now, young people are making money doing nothing really. I mean, some on social media, there are kids 21, 22 that are making millions of dollars by having people follow them. And there's a guy, this is my, my nephew, who's 10 years old, showed me a YouTube channel. This kid, he plays with toys. He has millions of followers. And all he's doing each day is playing with a toy. So we're competing. We're in a, we are in an industry. Like I said, we're going to build probably differently. We're always going to build, right? And the construction industry is notorious for being behind in technology, behind in everything. Also, yeah. Um, yeah I love so we have to, to compete for labor, which, I mean, before the pandemic, we had a labor shortage. Now it's really bad. And it's not probably, and if you're trying to attract young talent, you're competing then with a society who's making a lot of money doing nothing, right? So we're going to have to educate the young folks and make construction sex. And it's not, you know, showing them how you can make a lot of money in this industry by using your brain and not necessarily, right? And a lot of what we build is by using our brain power and not necessarily um, slinging punk, right? Because I think a lot of a lot of kids in school right now, if you say, hey, you want to go into construction? They think you're going to drag them out their classroom and put them on a, on a construction project in the hot sun and make them sick, right? I mean, yes, there's always going to be that and there's always going to be a market for that but our kids that we're educating I think we need to, to educate them as to what the industry has to offer I mean building there's so many facets we talked about the legal I mean you're in engineering and there's so there's technology there's so many things that there's touch. marketing there's, there's marketing there's, right and there's that that's particular to this industry that you have to know the jargon and know the language and know the vocabulary and know the players because we are competing for labor in a tight labor market, again, where kids are really on the internet playing with toys and making millions of dollars. So what can we do to attract the little girls into the industry? That they, 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 they Even the parents might have a different perspective of what the industry is, just like you have. Yeah, letting them know that we're not, you know, letting them know, like seeing folks like you and me and we were... We're, we're, we're women, we know we get, we dress up in our heels and we're going to work too, you know, but I work in construction, you know, I, I'm a lawyer, uh, you can be, you know, I have women, 
let me tell you, I, on social media, on Facebook, and people on groups that I'm in, when folks realize, young, I have young black women reach out to me, like, you're constructed. I said, this, can we do a Zoom to half an hour? I have half an hour, you tell them, I just want to know what you do. They don't know. They don't know. It's, they don't it's know. a marketing deficit. Yes. It's yeah, education. Yeah, yeah. Definite, definitely letting folks know that, you know, where I'm not going to work in, you know, in overalls and, and, and boots. I'm, I go to work and I, yeah, and I'm on projects and I have a hard hat and, you know, all those things too. But I'm helping people solve the problems that come up, you know, I'm, and you're helping people build, you're building, right? But it's it's just a perception of what construction is. Thank you so much for 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 this time. I, I love talking to you. It's, you know, this is definitely not work. <laughs> I really enjoy, what, you know, doing this podcast. It gives me an opportunity to connect even more with people that I have met in this industry that I know have so much to share, so much knowledge and experience. And uh, if you were to leave the listeners with two big uh, lessons, two big learns, what would they be? I'm going to leave one, of, one personal and one business, right? Personally, live life fearlessly. Don't be afraid of anything. There's nobody here with you. There's nobody that came before you and there's nobody coming after you that knows any more than you do. We all have our gifts. And so just use it and, and don't, be fe don't be afraid. Live life fearlessly, live life with some curiosity. And, and from a business standpoint, I think we talked about not doing things out of desperation. Being strategic and building your business. Have patience, patience, nothing, you know, This is the saying is Rome wasn't built in a day. Your business is not going to be built in a day. Your business, bu building your small business in construction is a journey and hopefully a lifetime journey that's going to bring you a lot of money and a lot of joy. So just be patient and be strategic. That's, that's so wise. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so Patricia. much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. We're going to do a continuation in the future. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Thriving in Construction, the podcast with Patricia Bonilla. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like to help support the podcast, please share it with others and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. If you have any suggestions or any related topics you would like us to tackle in our future episodes, feel free to reach Patricia by sending her a message through the website, anchor.fm slash thriving in construction or find her on LinkedIn. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week here in Thriving in Construction, the podcast.